Hello, welcome. This is Brian Rowe from LSNTAP, and we're really happy today to be doing a new webinar. This is one that we have not done in the past. It's on data ethics when designing civil justice intervention. Um, it's being put on by the Florida Justice Technology Center, um, who has been a great partner for us to work with this year. Um, and we've got some really good speakers. I'm going to turn it over um, to the Florida Justice Technology Center to take us through this. Um, and I'm going to have some announcements at the end with our upcoming webinars. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Um, this is Wilnita from the Florida Justice Tech Center and with also a fellow at Data and Society Research Institute. Uh, the speakers today, I'm really excited um, to have them because they're kind of at the, the forefront of um, these Big, big data discussions. Um, they're they're engaging at the national level um, within academia, with the private sector, um, around issue, issues related to the implications of big data, in particular to civil rights and low income populations. So we're really um, lucky to have them come and and speak to us and kind of um, share their insights and their tips as to how all of the discussions and all the things that they're learning um, through their work, um, how the civil justice community can take that and and use it as they're building their own technologies and using data. So we have Salon Barocas from a research associate at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton. And um, he will be speaking first. And then we have Ali Lang, a policy analyst at the Center for Democracy and Technology's Consumer Privacy Project. And then uh, you have me, I'm the Digital Officer of Florida Justice Tech Center and a fellow at the Data and Society Research Institute. And then the agenda for today is that I will um, introduce the issue, um, just a kind of general overview of data ethics when designing civil justice interventions. Uh, Salon will go into uh, a really interesting conversation about how machines learn to discriminate and he'll kind of unpack um, some people might be wondering um, what exactly that means and he'll unpack that term machine so as it's related to data and then the topic to um, Ali will be presenting will be digital a framework for digital decision making um, that programs may want to use and then we'll hopefully have um, five or ten minutes for any questions that folks have so just as a basic introduction um, a lot of you may be asking what exactly is big data and just so we're on the same page um, big data includes many types of data. It's uh, whether it's structured, semi-structured, or unstructured. Um, it can, and I have a, see I have a typo there, it can be from traditional digital sources inside and outside of your organization. So um, what makes it so large and so encompassing is that um, we're, when we think about big data, we're not only talking about the data that exists in an Excel spreadsheet and the data that your organization um, maybe collecting about your own programs, you know, we're talking about as well the census data, the various community sources of data that may be out there, um, the courts data, the um, various policy um, programs that may be collecting data, and things, you know, not only when, when we look at unstructured data, we can, we're looking at text, things like emails, things like Facebook interactions that you may have with your clients on Twitter or Facebook or social media, all of that is data. And and so uh, we're not only, look when we talk about big data, we're not only, I uh, just wanted to stress, we're not only talking about Excel-based structured data, that's structured data, we're talking about all the various avenues um, inside and outside of your office where information is being collected about clients or about yourself. And so not to um, go into the uh, a fear factor necessarily, it, the, we're, we're all beginning from a starting point where this, these vast amounts of information that we are creating about our lives and documenting, it has the power to improve our lives and I think a lot of groups are excited and interested in that and all of us um, here are as well because it often does. Um, that's not the problem. The, where the problems arise is when um, big data is being used, um, absent of human touch, and a single-minded 
um, focus on efficiency, um, and that can lead to troubling patterns which can isolate groups that are already at society's margins. So it's sort of when we start taking data, these vast amounts of data, building models, um, predictive functions, and um, judgment calls um, using many pots of data that without um, you know really checking it carefully for various things that's when we can it can lead into problems and it can it can create conditions that um, can be harmful especially for the communities that that the civil justice community tries to serve and so kind of wrapping some of that up um, research a lot of people in academia um, and we're lucky to have Salon because he's one of them that studies this, is that research has found that big data analytics, um, they can discover useful regularities in a data set that are just pre-existing patterns of exclusion and inequality. And, and they can also inherit the prejudice and biases of prior decision making. And um, a lot of that, it, uh, it's, uh, it's maybe hard to grasp and I, I understand that. But it's um, essentially um, what it's saying is that some of the patterns, some of the, the when we put variables together and we start to make patterns uh, and discover patterns in the data, we often don't realize that some of those patterns um, have built in um, prejudice or biases of the people that 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 kind of. We created some of the framework for putting those, uh, making those, putting those assumptions together. So, this is where a lot of the issues arise, and um, the speakers that follow will explain that um, a little bit better. And then, ultimately, um, another tenant that comes when we think about using big data in a civil justice con context is that. Um, we should all accept um, that we all have biases, and and once we start from that that front of um, of uh, we all have biases built into our decision making, um, then we can better understand and 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 the the importance of when we work with data, being aware of those biases um, and knowing and starting from a place that I need to look at this carefully because we're all humans and, and we all have hidden biases and sometimes they can creep in in ways um, in forms like predictive analytics that we might not realize and so that's what we need to check. So what what do we do now um, essentially? Now it, big data is out there, everybody's excited uh, including myself, I'm constantly looking for how to use um, dif different data sources um, to gain insights about the communities we serve. Um, so what, what do we do now um, as far as making sure that our use of data um, is effective and useful and it's not uh, detrimental? Um, quite simply, uh, the speakers that follow will um, talk about other specific things you can do, but um, I like to start from a place of just developing a plan and making, uh, when you work with data, making, putting it in the forefront always to have a personal responsibility to uh, yourself and to your clients to always look at the ethical security and the privacy issues that deal with data. Um, if that is the single most um, thing that you get out of this presentation, I will consider that a success. Um, just for people to simply know to, um, tailor that excitement with big data with caution um, caution and awareness of the various pitfalls that are that are hidden in how we use data and just a few quick um, things about what that plan would look like and the infographic that is up there as a handout kind of has a more elaborate um, overview of this plan um, but I'll just quickly go over a few of the points um, Step one is just knowing your data, knowing the data that you're using. Um, the Federal Trade Commission, which is a lot of you may have heard, they're very active in this kind of big data and civil rights front. And so they've issued a few papers and they recommend um, for looking at things like quality, uh, accuracy, and usability. Uh, I'll just point out a few things. Accuracy is a big one. 
a lot of people may want to be able to understand um, things like uh, the eviction rate of their of a certain community, but they and they have you know a specific a small set of data. Maybe they're they're just using the data set from their legal aid program um, to analyze that, and they feel like they can make conclusions about what you know what is really taking place in that area and you know people have to step back sometimes and say I you know I don't have a data that's representative to be answer, to be able to answer that I can you know looking at a very limited data set this is the only insight that I can gain so it's just being realistic about the data that you have and not trying to do any kind of overlooming um, predictions and then usability is making sure that, that the people that are making um, decisions or analyzing the data you know are trained are properly trained and, and are aware of all of these kind of nuances as well um, step two is to examine uh, data sensitivities for communities that you're hoping to serve and there's been a lot of discussion on the LSN tap listserv already about this um, especially in regard to um, the LBGT uh, community um, and people thinking about if, if you're hoping um, if you're if there's specific communities that might be adversely affected by your data collection you know reconsider what you know do you need all of that data um, and and always thinking about the ramifications of collecting um, the types of data and using it to do uh, using and analyzing it and how that might affect um, certain communities in a bad way so that that would be the step two the the step three whoops is that there's there's actually um, existing laws uh, consumer protection laws uh, that are increasingly applicable to big big data practices uh, and this is a collection of some of them um, the Federal Credit Reporting Act um, and there's several uh, equal opportunity laws and as well as uh, you know you might also be in a state uh, that that may have more progressive um, laws or local laws so you might you this kind of getting a lay of the the legal um, the legal um, environment that you are your big data analysis work is taking place in is is a really good way to kind of know um, the historical precedents as well of of and the issues that have come up, but just kind of also uh, help you to um, to gain to to gain some insight into uh, some of the ways that you're clients should be protected uh, when you're using their data and finally uh, to try to include and empower your your clients uh, it's uh, useful to and this is a very new thing but just to to um, think of ways of making your clients aware of uh, maybe not your necessarily your own big data practices but just the the existence uh, existence of data in their lives and how your program may be using their data how other programs may may be using their data just to to build literacy because ultimately these are communities that um, uh, even though your program may be um, doing all of ethically all of the right practices we still want want them to to become uh, on, on their day-to-day -day life just to become more simply more aware of of how they should be cautious about data so if there's simple ways um, that you can whether you put together a flyer that you distribute to your um, clients of ways of helping to educate to them about their rights um, regarding people collecting their data um, I think that is a really good grassroots way to kind of build data literacy among um, a community of people that really probably have no other way to get this information unless they they have older kids that are savvy or or they um, themselves you know have an interest and in, and do their own research so just looking into the the future uh, I think there's a lot of changes going on in in the civil justice uh, 
context and this this may be this is a this presentation is is a very introductory attempt to um, kickstart what hopefully will be an ongoing conversation um, about data ethics because I think uh, as the years progress that um, with various state and national groups looking at predictive analytics and triage algorithms and justice portals and expert systems and things like document assembly, um, all of these questions are going to become uh, increasingly uh, important and also that the context will continue to change. Um, the laws might change. Um, so this, is, this presentation is, is an attempt to take this very complex conversation that currently exists mostly in academia and the private sector and and hope and taking it and and putting it in the civil justice community in the hopes that people will um, to kind of preemptive some of the the issues that may come up in the years to come as a civil justice community looks to build these more sophisticated um, kind of big data tools so um, as looking looking to the future the warm home to the future um, you know, will the national civil justice community need a um, multidisciplinary uh, data ethics committee, uh, institutional review boards to, to maybe uh, an entity that can review um, the civil justice community's uh, data projects um, to make sure that they meet several ethical standards? Uh, will programs that are getting uh, um, increasingly using data and and to, you know, for triage algorithms or for their own portals, will you will we eventually need responsible um, data program managers in each program? These are these are questions um, that are open ended. Uh, I don't think they're applicable right at the moment, but they're they are a place where we might be in in the years to come. So at this time. I'm going to turn it over to um, Salom Barocas from uh, the Center for International Technology Policy at Princeton University uh, so that he can present, uh, start his presentation. Great. Just as Hi. a quick reminder, if you've got any questions, please feel free to type them uh, and we are watching the questions area here. Go for it. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. I um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I'll um, hopefully have a chance to follow up on a fair amount um, of the important points that uh, Bonita already introduced. Um, let's see, hopefully I have, yep, okay, great. Um, just checking to see if I have control of the slides. Um, so um, it may be very familiar to some of you, given the work that you do, um, uh, how discrimination law works, but I thought this would just be a quick um, way to provide some background before I dive into some of the more big data specific issues um, that, are, uh, that are of concern to the civil rights community. Um, so in particular, um, what's I think an important distinction to draw here at the start is between the two doctrines in discrimination law, um, and I do this in part because um, we often imagine that uh, potentially people who are programming systems to make important decisions that affect people's life chances um, might be affected by conscious malice or intentions to purposely discriminate. And we then would have an existing set of law and disparate treatment which would allow us to, to kind of nicely handle those cases. So whether or not someone is making a decision as a human on their own to discriminate or whether they've designed a program intentionally to do the same thing, the law should handle those cases in the same way. Um, but of course there's also a disparate impact doctrine which basically allows us to also capture cases where there may not have been conscious choices to discriminate but nevertheless the way decisions were made has a manifest disparate impact along the lines of race or gender or disability. Um, and here what's often important is to be able to show that there are these statistical discrepancies and outcomes according to things known as protected classes. So these are things like race or gender. Um, and I introduce this here in part to say that in many respects, um, big data seems to be a way to actually combat disparate treatment in the sense that um, I'll, I'll often refer to, um, as an example, hiring decisions um, where people either are consciously prejudiced in the way that they make decisions about who to hire or they might more likely, increasingly so now, um, be uh, unconsciously biased in their assessments. This is something known as implicit bias. Um, and here, the hope is that um, data and the move to uh, make these kinds of important decisions in hiring more data-driven could be an important vehicle to combat the persistence of discrimination in hiring. 
Um, but what I'll try to show today actually is that unfortunately there are some rather subtle ways in which using data to make hiring decisions can still result in avoidable, potentially avoidable disparate impacts. Um, and so what I'll try to focus on here is whether or not the existing doctrine of disparate impact can still be a useful tool in trying to make sure that um, even when decisions are data driven um, that we have some legal recourse in the event that they are discriminatory. But let me try to give some substance to um, Oops. Yeah. some substance to uh, this idea that you know data-driven decisions can be discriminatory. So there's some important examples which are which are also cited in some of the materials from the FTC that was mentioned earlier, um, but I'll just walk through them and give you a bit more context. So this comes from an important article that Kate Crawford wrote a few years ago about an application that was developed by the mayor's office in Boston known as Street Bump. Street Bump was a very clever idea. The hope here was that um, the city was not um, especially effective in, in locating potholes uh, and all the potholes in the city. Um, and some people realized that perhaps they could crowdsource the problem. They could have people install an application on their smartphone, which would take advantage of the fact that it has a built-in uh, GPS chip, but also has an accelerometer, which would basically recognize when people are potentially driving over uneven road. So if your phone shakes a lot, that might be an indication that that's the location of a pothole. And then the phone would automatically, in the background, without people having to do anything, report that back to the city. So this was a sort of clever way of trying to you know, uh, rely on citizens to contribute to the hard work of detecting potholes. And this was an important example for Kate, because what the city quickly discovered is that there was a significant bias in the data that was coming back. In particular, this is what social scientists refer to as a reporting bias. So um, you might anticipate that not everyone in the city uh, owns a smartphone, um, or even less surprising that even if you own a smartphone, only some small set of people would actually even know about this application and decide to install it. And so the data that was coming in tend to skew very much toward wealthier areas, or areas in particular where there were young professionals. And so the, 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 the data that the city was receiving um, wasn't really representative of the entire population, and in particular, probably underrepresented significantly the poor areas of the city. Um, and so if the city were to actually begin to direct its resources to addressing these problems, it would actually probably have the perverse result of focusing more attention on those areas that are probably already uh, relatively well off. And so this is just an important first um, point to say that the data sets we use to make important decisions can be affected by the ease with which they are, with which data is captured or the ease with which information is reported back. Um, and it's um, it's a tricky problem. Oops, I can't see. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, it's a tricky problem because oftentimes the data we uh, are able to collect uh, is biased in systematic ways. I mean, it may be for reasons like I just mentioned that certain people potentially are less involved in the sort of data generating activities that would be necessary to uh, produce these things. Or they could be less involved in the formal economy. So think, for instance, of people who don't own, own credit cards. Um, or they could have less access or maybe are less fluent in the technology that produces these kinds of tra digital traces. Um, or another possibility, which I imagine is something that you do and you, you consider in your own work is that certain populations might have reasons, historical reasons, to avoid contact with institutions that would otherwise collect important information. And finally, if the data we're using comes potentially from the private sector, um, it may well be too that certain parts of the market might be perceived as less profitable, less important, and therefore not as well subject to, uh, to monitoring. And so I think in practice, even though people who are very excited about big data um, tend to think of it as being a way to capture the activity of an entire population. In practice, it tends to be what social scientists call a convenient sample, meaning you're actually just collecting information that is easy for you, convenient for you to collect. Um, and that in general, they tend to lack the rigor that would be common in, in more traditional social science research where you're purposely setting out to try to collect a, a representative sample. The problem here ultimately is though that even if you're sensitive to these issues, as Boston was, um, it can be very difficult to figure out how to compensate for it. So in the case of Boston, they actually did something pretty clever, which is that they realized that their garbage trucks uh, were already um, trans, uh, were already moving throughout the city, and so they just used their own existing garbage trucks to, base, to basically do this work rather than relying on people. Um, 
But in some cases, it might be hard to even figure out what mechanism to rely on to cultivate a more representative sample of the population. And here, this just requires a lot of uh, kind of careful thinking and potentially some creative solutions, uh, even when you recognize that you might be um, dealing with a biased sample. Okay, uh, let me now take an example from employment. So uh, I mentioned earlier that you know the hope is that big data could be a way to overcome some of the prejudices and biases that persist in hiring decisions. Um, so now consider an example of um, a company that basically wants to figure out how to automate the process of ass assessing job applicants. And this is increasingly something that a lot of low wage, high turnover employers are doing um, because they're often flooded with applications. And so imagine a situation in particular um, where you basically are looking at historical uh, documents. You're looking at which of my previous employees performed well. Which of my which of the people I have hired in the past went on to actually uh, demonstrate that they are you know really uh, effective person on the job. And so you're using his historical data to try to tease out what seems to be unique about those people who in the past tended to be the high performing uh, employees. Now imagine the situation where um, employers in the past had systematically passed over applicants um, because of their gender or race. Um, and now imagine in the future that even when the, the system that is being developed doesn't rely on explicit things like gender or race to make decisions, but instead is considering perhaps where someone went to college, it could actually discover that in the past no one who had been who had applied from Howard or Wellesley, for example, a historically black college and a all women's college, had been hired. And so they, the machine simply looking at the historical pattern of how previous decision makers evaluated applicants would basically learn to, to kind of see these signals, Howard or Wellesley, as a sign that this person probably wouldn't be good on the job. This is someone that, that probably wouldn't be uh, what the company wanted to hire. Um, and so here is just a way in which, as uh, Olita was saying earlier, um, big data models can in fact just inherit the bias or prejudice of previous decision makers. And this problem becomes, um, oops, sorry, uh, becomes tricky in part because the way that we try to evaluate whether or not the decision procedures we've developed by looking at historical data, whether those decisions are actually um, accurate, is to actually just use a subset of uh, the data uh, that we know from the past and see, um, okay, we're going to run the data where we know whether or not someone has been a uh, well-performing employee in the past through the model, and we're going to see what the model predicts. And if it predicts that they're, they're like a high-performing employee, then we say that the model's accurate. The problem here is, though, that the, the, the data we're using to evaluate the model is equally tainted. It's been equally biased. And so there's actually no obvious way to rely on this evaluation method to decide whether or not it's actually biased because the way we even evaluate the model is using the same bias data. But let me make it even more complicated. So let's imagine a situation where, um, yes, people had been hired from uh, Howard or Wellesley in the past, uh, and those people go on to have you know, somewhat of a lengthy career, um, but the evidence in, the, in their employment records suggests that perhaps they weren't the highest performing employees, that you know, they were sort of either middle of a pack or maybe they weren't you know, particularly good at what they were assigned to do. What this fails to recognize is that oftentimes the, the data we record about people's performance can itself be a reflection of the conditions under which they work. So if the workplace had been, for instance, hostile to women, um, or there were certain kind of institutional dynamics that made people from a certain racial group feel unwelcome, or certain more desirable assignments and tasks were not assigned to them, um, it might then suggest that these people, in fact, weren't the best employees but in fact really is a reflection of the kind of institutionalized and subtle uh, discrimination uh, that persisted in the institution itself. And so to, to kind of use this data as a, a kind of objective assessment of who is going to do well in the future would just in fact bring those dynamics really early into the process of even deciding who to hire in the first place. And so this I think is a really pernicious problem. We have to be sensitive to uh, what the data is actually capturing, and oftentimes it's not just capturing people's innate capacities, but instead it's a reflection, at least in part, about how they are treated and the conditions under which they work. And so here the question is, you know, how would you figure it out how someone would have performed under different non-discriminatory circumstances? Um, and this can often be an impossible question to answer in a statistically rigorous way, um, but it's, a, it's an exercise that you should at least try to walk through in your own mind to consider what you're doing when you rely on historical data to automate future assessments.
Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and then the next point I wanted to raise is um, oftentimes we're not just using examples of individual people, we're deciding also at the same time on what features, which variables uh, attached to each record um, we're going to be considering. So for instance, when I'm developing a model to decide who to hire in the future, not only am I going to look at past employees, but I'm going to also make a decision about, you know, should I look at their annual review rating? Should I be looking at their email records? What variables am I going to fold into my analysis? Um, and this is often a complicated decision, um, but the way I like so to it, focus... Oh, it looks like Allison may actually have a comment here. Um, uh, in the GoToWebinar, there's an option to raise your hand. I'm going to try unmuting her and see if she can actually ask it directly. Sure. Um, you should be unmuted on our side. Uh, you can check to see if it if you're muted on your side, but we have tried to open it up there. Um, and does not seem to be working. If if you're able to type that question into uh, questions or whatever that comment is, uh, Allison from SRLN, please let us know. Or if you can unmute on your side, I will leave it unmuted on our side. So but we cannot hear you if you're talking. Okay, I'll, I'll continue for now and hopefully um, I can address the question if you post it to the, um, the question box. Um, so the, the point that this slide is trying to make is that um, sometimes um, in making choices about which variables to consider, we might uh, produce an avoidable disparate impact. And one way to think about this is that Historically, redlining, um, specifically mortgage redlining, um, was clearly pretense. It was intentional discrimination where uh, banks were relying on a known proxy for race in order to deny black people loans. Um, and in particular, the, the way they did this was by saying that people who lived in certain areas of a city, potentially a zip code, um, should just categorically not be entitled to loans because they're high risk. Um, this was an intentional practice uh, trying to mask intentional discrimination, but imagine a situation instead where we have unintentional redlining. So, um, I think whoever might be controlling the computer. Uh, um, okay, well, I'll continue to talk while this gets back to the slide. Um, so, um, what was I going to say? Oh, right, okay. So, here, the, the interesting challenge is, um, imagine if we're a bank and the only information we have is something like the average repayment rate on a, on a loan by zip code, which is in fact sort of what was being done in these traditional scenarios of redlining. But imagine current circumstances where we only have very coarse information. We only have information that says, if you live in the zip code, on average, you are likely to repay your loan at this rate. Because the information is so coarse, it might say that certain neighborhoods are just, relatively speaking, much less good of a candidate uh, for, uh, for a loan. Um, but of course, what's really problematic about this way of doing things is that if you had additional information, if you knew much more about the individual residents who resided in those zip codes, you would discover, of course, that there are certain people that, in fact, would be great candidates for a loan, and perhaps others less so. Um, but because you're restricted to this extremely coarse information, you end up kind of discounting the entire neighborhood out of hand. And the question here then is, does the information that we rely on provide enough granularity so that certain parts of the population aren't sort of discounted out of hand? Um, and another way of thinking about this is when we decide whether or not um, there is a degree of error that we feel is tolerable in making these assessments, um, we often aren't sensitive to how that error rate is distributed across the population. Is it, for instance, just that the error is random in the sense that whoever you might be, no matter your gender or race, you have an equal chance of being subject to an erroneous decision? Or is the error actually systematic? Does it mean that if you live in the zip code, you are much, much more likely to be subject to an erroneous assessment? And here, then, uh, I think there's a really important question, even in people, even for people who are doing important work of defending the poor, um, which is, you know, how much information, how much money should we spend, and how much resources should we invest in collecting data that allow us to make these more granular distinctions, which really mean that we don't subject historically marginalized populations to higher error rates. Um, and I'll just say that this way of thinking tends to kind of 
equate um, the parity and accuracy across different groups to a notion of fairness. So something is fair so long as we ease, we, no matter who we are, have an equal chance of maybe getting um, subject to an erroneous decision. But in a way, I also just want to quickly point out that in many circumstances, um, we might think that there are cases where having less information and not being able to achieve certain rates of accuracy can have important benefits for historically disadvantaged communities. And the obvious example of this would be something like um, when I don't know, um, for instance, like how valuable a customer is, I have to actually provide a common level of service. So perhaps some people saw this story from a few years ago, uh, from a few weeks ago about Amazon Prime not being offered across entire areas of major metropolitan cities. And the thinking there was that, of course, you know, there's some areas where there are not enough customers, they don't do enough business, and so they're only going to offer Amazon Prime in those areas where there's a sufficient number of people uh, to do that. Well, if they couldn't actually carve up the market that granularly, they would have to offer a more common level of service across the population. And so the idea here is just to simply point out that like, sometimes improved accuracy can harm the poor and historically marginalized uh, because it allows profit-seeking companies, for instance, or even governments uh, to focus resources in ways that are just um, reinforcing inequality. Right. Okay, sorry. Um, oops. Okay, and then the final thing I'll say before I conclude is that um, there's going to be these final cases too, which are extremely difficult. So Evolve is a company that helps um, perform the kind of task I was describing earlier, which is uh, evaluating job applicants. The slide that's presented here is marketing material, which focuses on how they are helping employers try to figure out who, who is current, which of its current employees are likely to leave, likely to turn over or engage in attrition um, in the near, you know, next few months. And the idea here is that in this, in this material anyway, uh, that the company could take some kind of steps to intervene to retain people so that they don't actually um, lose that particular employee. In practice, however, companies like Evolve and others um, are, are used very often in, in assessing job applicants. So not people who are currently employed, but actually people who are imply, applying for employment. And we know of an important anecdote about Evolve because Evolve was hired by Xerox to help it evaluate applicants for its call centers. Um, call centers are very low-paying jobs with high uh, turnover rates. Uh, training is a significant cost, and so Xerox and others are trying to minimize the turnover rate. They want to get people who are going to be on the job for more than a few weeks, a few months. Um, and here, um, what Naval was able to do is figure out what was the variable that best predicts whether someone will stay for, you know, let's say, a six-month period. Um, and it turns out that the distance the person happens to live uh, from the place of employment is the best predictor of how long they're likely to stay. Um, which may not be terribly surprising. The idea here is that there's a fair amount of community involved. Um, but the, the reason I point this out is because Evolve itself recognized that distance from work was often going to be highly correlated with race, given racial geographic segregation in the United States. And so Evolve counseled Xerox not to use this variable, even though it's statistically the most predictive um, feature. Um, and what this, I think, reveals is that there are these lasting historical effects of racial discrimination in particular that mean that even when companies are simply pursuing something that seems like a rational business objective, uh, they can end up um, engaging in activities which have a manifest disparate impact. And here, ultimately, uh, I'll just end by saying that this is going to be a really tricky problem because in many cases, uh, even considering those features, those variables, which seem you know, statistically relevant and on their face perfectly reasonable to, to think about in making these assessments, um, increasingly they're going to be um, correlated with things that we should not be considering. So this is what computer scientists have described as redundant encodings. What this means is that my gender or race or religion or disability status, those facts about me will often be uh, highly reflected across multiple other dimensions, other data that you have about me. And so even when you're considering these seemingly uh, benign facts, even relevant facts, um, you're going to be considering things potentially that are, that are highly correlated. And this then just presents a very difficult problem about making hard choices about whether or not to proceed. So in the case of Xerox, it decided no, it would not use this fact, even though it would reduce the accuracy of its predictions. And likewise, other companies actually came to a different conclusion. They felt comfortable using it, despite the fact um, that they knew that it potentially had this disparate impact. 
Um, so I'll just conclude there. Oh, and the final thing I'll say too is that um, I don't want to suggest that, that um, using data to make important decisions is necessarily a bad idea. In fact, often using these systems to make hard choices kind of brings and makes uh, brings into greater clarity a lot of the important and difficult political choices we make. Um, and this can be an opportunity, rather than kind of obscuring the stakes of these important decisions, uh, having to formalize them in some ways can allow you to have a more effective debate about the values that they uh, potentially en uh, endanger. So I'll just stop there. Oh, and for the, oh, sorry, the final point, very, very, very final thing I'll say is that if anyone is particularly interested in my presenter here and would like to have some more legal background, I have a paper that's on this topic with a, a co-author who's a legal scholar that goes into much greater depth. So thanks very much. An interesting thing to take away is that as he highlighted some of these uh, companies that are emerging, uh, um, starting to use big data to decide who's a good worker, who is a good person that I can rent my apartment to, um, it's important for advocates to know that um, there's people in the private sector increasingly also using big data and are not so ethically inclined the way that we're outlining it here. So a lot of these issues are going to eventually, in five or ten years or sooner, going to become issues that will be at the forefront and a grassroots working with clients on work, various worker and labor rights issues. So the, these kind of understanding big data is both going to be an advocate issue that we work with directly in our clients and it's something for us to keep in mind um, as we use big data ourselves. Um, on okay. the practical side though I will definitely mention that Northwest Justice Project um, had engaged in a a research project looking at our foreclosure data and the national foreclosure data databases along with a researcher from the University of Washington um, last year and we had to engage in the who's going to have access to the data, what does the data sharing agreement look like between us and the researcher, um, how much of that data can be shared in a publication later, how do we protect clients' privacy, um, confidentiality, that type of stuff um, in that data sharing agreement. So this stuff is very practical um, when you start partnering on projects or using the giant amounts of data that many legal services organizations have to try to find trends in their own community. Um, so thank you, Solon, for all that excellent introduction. Some of this first half here will be pretty redundant to Solon's work, um, so I will try not to take too long going through um, some of the beginning part and then um, I'll go ahead and explain sort of what CDT has done with the work. So I wanted to quick um, explain a little bit about who CDT is. Um, okay, so CDT is a nonprofit uh, organization based in Washington, D.C. Um, and there's a little list here of stuff that we're well known for, but basically CDT is a 20-year-old organization that has been advocating on um, technology and internet policy since the beginning of the internet. So it's really an interesting place to work. Um, there's a lot of really good work being done there based from, you know, things like internet architecture and the structures of the internet all the way through to online privacy um, and including everything in between like free expression online and, um, you know, security and surveillance concerns. So what the government knows about what's happening on your technology. So it's a great place to work. Um, we have been working with academics and uh, civil rights organizations in Washington, D.C. and around the country on some of the issues that Solon raised. So CDC worked with um, some civil rights organizations and uh, other advocacy organizations, and we were trying to figure out, you know, what to, to do with all of the information and the insight um, that Solon just presented. And, and essentially one thing that we wanted to focus on and what CDT is sort of best at and, and well known for is helping companies um, make good decisions on the design end, right? And so rather than sort of letting things go too far and then having to walk them back, CDT is pretty well known for um, helping sort of forestall some of the worst case scenarios. And so we took the work that Solon had done along with a lot of other academics um, and we sort of set about creating a project to help, um, help companies who are interested in, in making good decisions figure out, you know, what they needed to do to their own technology um, and so the advice that we have here and the insight that we have was sort of specifically focused on the private sector. But I think a lot of it um, could be applied more broadly um, to anybody who is creating an automated system and is, and is concerned about some of the things that Solon has pointed out and, and some of the issues that we've seen raised. So that was sort of the, the nature of the project um, that we're doing. 
And so, again, this is a bit redundant to Solon's presentation, but just wanted to make the point that automated decision-making systems um, and, and algorithmic sort of processing is, is really present everywhere um, and can have a pretty big impact on individuals. Um, and, and, but we get asked a lot, you know, what is different about this kind of discrimination and what's different about these concerns compared to other situations? And, and I think that it's important to remember um, the the speed and the and the sort of spread of the technology. So if there's a problem within um, one of the problems that Silla mentioned if it exists in the system, it will be applied across the entire network really quickly, um, and and it will affect a lot of people. So it's it's really uh, bigger than just sort of basic concerns. And, and actually, a really interesting observation that I think is worth noting, and it sort of relates to Solon's point about how error is distributed, is that you know, for one single individual, it's, it's sort of variable whether or not an individual decision affects them. But if you're looking at um, society at large, you can sort of see the huge concerns with discrimination and bias if they're perpetuated across everybody all at once. All right, so the Civil Rights Arrows, Principles for the Era of Big Data was a document that was written by a group of civil rights organizations in Washington, D.C. You can see the signatories here on the bottom. Um, this group created, you know, just some basic ideas of what they thought needed to, to be applied um, in these technologies as far as promoting civil rights and making sure that the laws that Solon pointed out were not undermined in this context. Um, you can see the list here, and this is a really good list, and it was, it was really, you know, well thought through, and there's a lot of really good organizations that signed the document, but on the other hand, if you look at these just instructions and you imagine handing them to somebody who is creating this technology, um, these aren't really something that are, that are you could sit down and just say, okay, we're going to do these things. Um, they're not direct, they're not really straightforward. These are really principles, right? These are really high-level observations. And so we sort of took these as the jumping off point, CDT did, and said, you know, how do we actually apply this? How do we, how do we help people use these principles but, but integrate them into technology that they're using? And hi, Ali. This this is Wilnada. Um, I'm sorry that keeps popping up, but uh, can you can you remind us again what year that was? The Civil Rights Principles for the Era of Big Data came out in 2014. I'm pretty sure. In two thousand. Okay. Yeah. So it's been out for a few years. Yeah. Good. Thank and you. And they're cited. They're cited in if you if you review the um, the White House uh, Big Data report, they're in. You can you can see those in there. They were it was um, pretty well received. So it's like made a pretty high level impact already. So when we were sitting, we sat down and sort of said, okay, how do you apply these things to technology? And a few things that we needed to, to observe is that the stakes are high, um, you know, as we pointed out, for individuals and also for society. So it's not just that these are things that are traditionally consumer protection, right, but it's, it's really much bigger than that. Um, on the other hand, if you're thinking about the huge number of ways in which automated technology is used, it's really hard to come up with some sort of concrete, hard and fast rules that you can apply across the board. There are some examples, of, you know, I think Solon's presentation presented some good scenarios here where there are some examples where it actually can be beneficial um, to sort of have some of these insights and some of this data as far as preventing discrimination. Um, and there are some where obviously it's, it's bad. And so it just kind of depends on what kind of context you're using the automated decision making, whether or not it is um, more constructive or de de destructive to have some of these pieces of data floating around. So it's hard to create one sort of concrete concept. But, oh, this is kind of a little bit warped. But so what we did was we first sat down and said, okay, how do, how do people create automated technology? Right? What are the processes that people use to sort of create these systems? And, and let's just sit down and figure out, you know, what this looks like. And so we created this um, sort of map, and it's not universal, but we divided the, the process into to four, or kind of five phases, really. So you can see here that you would design a system, you build the, you build the model, you test it, you refine it. So there's, impl there's implement over here as well. So you implement it, you test and refine it, and then you evaluate and execute your decision. And what we did was we sat down and said, what goes into each of these steps? And so here you have, you know, coming up with just an idea of something to automate. Why are you doing this? What's, what's your goal? What's your mission? You know, what's, what's the actual process that you're trying to, to limit and so, or to create? And so there's this first step is really, really important. And actually, I think this first whole, this whole row here is, is pretty critical because here's where you sort of ask yourself some of the really key scoping, key, uh, scoping questions. So here you have to figure out what are the parameters of the problem, what are we trying to figure out, and what kind of results do we expect. You establish your variables, you constrain, your, constrain them, and you figure out you know, what variables do we think relate to what outcomes. And then here is a lot where a lot of um, 
So one's insights on data, uh, the actual data that goes into it would, would come into play. Where is your data coming from? What is what is contained within it? And how do you know if it's good or bad? Um, and then the next part is sort of related, which is how are you going to analyze this? And, and are the tools that you're going to use, do they have any sort of um, background in them? Right. And so the, the data question, I think, is probably the easiest to grab onto, which is, you know, uh, where where is your data coming from and what were the biases of the people who collected this data in the first place? And bias doesn't necessarily in this context have to be something that's active, as someone pointed out, in some ways it could be passive, right? It can be an absence of information. It could be that people are not represented. It could be that people are represented um, in ways that are not unfair from the beginning. And so this top row really contains a huge amount of, of steps and a huge amount of process or a potential for the process to become sort of flawed by design. So this top row is really critical. And then from there on, you go forward and you say, okay, what kind of technology are we going to use? Are we going to use um, machine learning? Are we going to let this thing, let the technology sort of proceed unsupervised? Or are we going to stay involved? And you have to sort of design a feedback mechanism so you can evaluate your own, you know, technology and your own and your own use of it. And then you might implement your model, and then you'll sort of go through the process of figuring out, is it working, is it working, testing it. Maybe you add more data. In that case, you want to go back and make sure that you know, you're running through this part of the process again. And then over here, ultimately, you'll end up with some results, and then ultimately you execute the decision. And so we created this just for, our, for us. And initially, I just created it for my own sort of information, but trying to figure out you know, how do people use this technology, how is it running, um, and, and then we sort of thought, okay, so now we have a sense of how people create automated technology. You know, maybe not all these steps happen in every case, but in general, this is sort of the process that is followed. How can we help people who are using, who think this way, who think in these sort of contexts, how can we help them integrate um, some steps that will, that will prevent some of the harms that Salon pointed out? So we, we split it up into um, these sort of general categories, and we thought, you know, one of the most important things that people can do is just ask themselves some basic questions, right? Don't let them don't let themselves or their process or their employees or their company proceed sort of unchecked without creating any sort of background for themselves to um, to uh, sort of in investigate their own assumptions. Um, so here are a few questions that we think are relevant in the design stage. As I mentioned, you know, what's the source of your data? Was it collected by people, right, or was it automated in some way um, to begin with? And what was the incentive structure of the people who collected it? This comes up a lot in the context that I think you guys are working in. You know, if you're thinking about police data and criminal justice data, um, a lot of that is collected by people, right, by officers. Um, what are their incentive structures? Do they have quotas they have to meet? Do they have um, neighborhoods they more frequently visit? Like, what are the what are the qualities that affect that data from the beginning? Um, so it's it's not that the data is you know without bias from the get go. Um, one, one important consideration may be whether or not the information was, also, was initially handwritten or was it um, something that was always machine readable only because there may, there may be an error, an actual error made in the translation between handwriting to, to machine readable format. And again, I think that's likely to be a concern in the, in the, in the uh, criminal justice for, uh, context and format. Um, and then there are some next questions here for the rest of the design section. You know, how could you overcome this? How could you how could you clean the data? Is it representative? Are there other 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 populations who aren't represented? Um, is there anything that you think should just be explicitly prohibited um, from your process um, from the beginning? And so these are a few questions we thought would be relevant to ask in that initial design phase. I mean, just going back briefly to the to this. And so now we've sort of these are questions that you ask yourself in these in these steps. And what we're going to do is go through. Um, similar questions that we have, we thought people should ask themselves kind of going all the way around this, this wheel. So, so now if you're in the phase of building your model, what are some questions you need to ask yourself to make sure that you aren't um, making some of the mistakes that, that have raised concerns in the past? And here, and here you have some stuff that's a little bit harder to pin down. Um, generalizations and cultural assumptions is something that is not obviously a, necessarily a concrete um, assignment, and it's it's interesting how often we get um, pushback from people, particularly in the credit context, where they say, you know, for example, like women are women are at better credit risk. So if you're saying we can't include gender, you're actually disadvantage, you're creating a disadvantage for women um, in doing so. But that's something that we hear a lot. And there's there's entire papers written on this question. Um, we sort of push back and say we disagree. We think that it's more likely that there are other sort of cultural situations or cultural. Um, biases that that tend toward um, the result that you're seeing, which is that women are higher or lower risk for you 
but it may be the case that that's because women have historically had to meet higher standards in order to get credit to begin with, or it may be the case that um, society sort of discourages women from taking risks from the beginning, and so the bias is actually not about gender, right, it's about some other cultural relationship. And to ascribe it to gender sort of perpetuates it in a way that's concerning, but also doesn't really get at the actual problem of it, or the actual reason, and so in, in some cases it's just bad science. Um, this is a very hard thing to get people to, <laughs> to think about, um, but I think it's, it's important. And I think one thing that you could ask yourself if you're trying to figure out, you know, am I making this assumption or is it something that's, that's got some kind of like concrete science behind it, is if you'd be okay if people saw the reasons, right? If you said like, you know, women are, are a lower credit risk, um, and somebody said, why do you think that's true, right? You'd, if you would feel comfortable explaining that, then maybe you're in somewhat of a, a better position than if you feel uncomfortable explaining it. Um, there's some technical tools here as well that we think people should ask themselves about. Are there ways that you can sort of um, remove uh, people from, from a, a category of suspicion or like a targeted category if, if they don't need to be involved in that directly? Um, here's a comment that would re relate to Solon's point, you know, are there proxies around? Um, and then how much of the statistical process is required? Um, you know, how, how can you prevent those proxies to sort of from sort of becoming part of it? Um, you know, and this, and this last question I think is really hard for policy folks to understand, but maybe a little bit more easily understood by technical people, which is, you know, it, it, it basically just says, if, is it okay if at the end of the process you can't really explain why the answer is what it is? Um, you know, is that something that's acceptable in your context or not? And that's a question that only can answer. So here are a few questions we think you should ask if you're, once you're testing, you know, and again, getting back to Solon's point about error rates here, what is the acceptable error rate? You know, how, how right do you need to be before you're okay putting this thing out on the market and releasing it against people, um, making decisions about people's lives? And is the error rate evenly distributed? Um, that's maybe something that's hard to test, but I think is a really important check. Um, here's, here's a question about, you know, what, what factors are predominant in determining the outcomes? Gives you an opportunity to reflect on whether or not that's, um, those factors are fair, if that's something that you, you feel is right. And I think most of these, in general, are just about trying to figure out um, the connections between the results that you've had and then maybe if there's any concerning sort of reasons for those results. Um, one important process is to create a feedback mechanism and, and probably a way for individuals to report if they feel like there's been an error and a mistake so that you're not entirely relying on your own back end to determine the results. And then once you've implemented it, um, just sitting back and thinking, you know, what happens if there's a false positive or a false negative of this of this equation? Um, how do we deal with that? What, are, what is that stake for people? Again, just trying to connect it back to individuals themselves. Um, here's a good, uh, another way, another moment where you have a chance to report whether or not um, people can, can let you know if they feel they've been treated unfairly. You can sort of map those out and see if there's an underlying problem in those, you know, the tra in the commonalities among people who feel like they've been treated unfairly. Um, and then, importantly, we think you should have a human being sitting somewhere in this process. Um, is there a method for people to look through this, and, and if so, where in the process do you put that person, and what are their responsibilities, what are their obligations? Um, you know, who, does this person make the final determination, or does the machine make the final determination? Like, how do you figure out um, uh, who holds responsibility ultimately. And then as you're going through and changing it, all those, all those, all that, all those information that you get from those processes need to be reintegrated into the system, right? And then when you're doing that, you have to sort of consider that you have to go through back the, the original um, design phase and make sure that you're not introducing new data that is biased after you've, you know, done your initial checks. You have to go through and, and make sure that you're, you're integrating new technology or integrating new information in according with the ethics of the process that you want to create. And so we sat down and we said, here's a bunch of questions we think people should ask themselves. And what we did is we took the original wheel that we showed you guys and we had put the questions in general, although a sort of pared down version just to make it a little bit easier, um, on the outside of the ring. Here's sort of the design of, you know, where when you're asking, when you're at the phase of collecting, buying, generating, or figuring out your data, what do you need to ask yourself when you're in this space? And so here's a bunch of questions, um, sort of uh, trim versions of the questions we just went through. And ultimately the, the goal, this is still a document that's in, in progress because we're working with a few um, technology companies and other folks who use technology 
directly because CDT is an advocacy organization. So we're working with folks who sort of are in the field using this technology to make sure that this is productive. But the goal is to create a sort of one-page document that a policy team or a designer could have at their desk um, just as sort of a mindfulness check, you know, what kind of questions should I be asking myself as I go through this? How do I figure out, you know, what the what the civil rights community would like me to know? Um, and yeah, so we created this document and we hope that people will use it. And we are still working on it. So if you guys have any feedback for what you think needs to go in this outer ring, um, what you think you might find useful, or if, you know what's confusing about the process, we'd be very excited to hear that. So that's sort of where the project is at right now. Ali, thank you so much. Um, do you mind if I circulate this um, through the listserv, the um, national the, listserv, the, this handout, and, and get people's reaction as well that way? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. I think I sent you a, a PDF. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to make sure that, um, so I'll circulate because we're, we're past 2 o'clock um, already, but I wanted, thank you so much. Um, are there any questions? Because I, before they get off, I'd want to ask salon a few things. So Brian, um, let me know if there's you see anything on your end. Nope, no questions. Okay, then, so for me, um, just so we can get it on, on video at least and people can reference later, is uh, for you, Ali, do you, is this like an, on, do you envision people, this process being ongoing or is it really at the beginning of a project and, you know, like maybe quarterly that you would kind of Look at this. This kind of use this this guidance. Like, how do you how do you um, think this should be used? Uh, mostly as a beginning, or as like an ongoing kind of checking thing um, with a pro with a specific like automation project. Uh, it, cer it certainly seems true that the the bulk of the concerns as far as um, you know creating bias and embedding bias happen in, in the initial phases, right? Like you can sort of see. In this initial row, there's a lot of things that happen here where, you, where the the risks are pretty pretty obvious and pretty substantial. Um, so I certainly think that this should play an important role in designing your process. But once it's once it's created, you can't just sort of let it run because um, it's not entirely clear. It's funny, at least what kind of processing technology you're using. It's not clear necessarily um, that it will sort of stay in the zone that you've tried to create. And so. It's both, right? And I think that one of the things that we're trying to figure out with people is when you have a bunch of different automated systems that work in tandem but are not necessarily tied to the same data or not necessarily processing on the same um, system, how do you help sort that out? Like, how do you get systems to interact with each other while sort of keeping some of these things in mind? And so it, there's a lot of bigger questions that need to be answered, but I think in general the answer to your question is is that it, it should be, you know, the the, the Testing and refining and evaluating phases all should include this process um, uh, throughout the, the life cycle of an algorithm. But yeah, I think the bulk of the concern might happen in that initial design phase. And, okay. and beyond that, it, it seems clear that it, whenever you're using a service that is collecting data in some way, a lot of those services will update their terms, they will update the amount of information that they're collecting on you or other people about it. So I would definitely have some type of a quarterly or twice yearly check on those systems to see where they fall into um, your ethics and the standards or defaults or features that you really want to enable or use along with the data that's being collected because they're going to change progressively. Yeah, this is... Um... It's am it's amazing. I haven't seen something like this that breaks it out into stages. It's am amazingly useful. So I'd like I want to circulate it extensively to the community. Um, and then my final question, just to either of you, is that is the FTC um, still the main kind of federal institution for advocates to keep an eye on in in how you know how big data practices are being regulated, or are there some other um, institutions that are starting to um, make you know trying to starting to guide uh, big data practices that, that we should keep an eye out for. Do you want to start, Ali, maybe, and then I can come in, too? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think the CFPB is one agency you want to look at, especially with respect to credit and lending. I think they're going to be more involved in sort of um, what kind of data is acceptable, how decisions have to be made, and, and I think sort of maybe reevaluating some of the transparency um, requirements around date uh, decisions that are made outside necessarily of the context of the FCRA, which is um, sort of the major 
um, guideline. I think also the Department of Justice has taken a, a keen interest in local law enforcement use of data analytics, and they're trying to sort of figure out what guidance they want to give and what requirements they want to have. Um, but it will depend, I think, a little bit on, on as you guys pointed out in your, in your advanced materials, so a lot of this is being done through third-party vendors. So I think it will depend a little bit about, on you know, how, how much power they have to control those. Um, what goes into those systems, which are now back out of the government sort of open data section and into the proprietary technology um, world. So I'm not sure what, how exactly that will work out. Okay. Thank you. And I'll just add really quickly, too, that you know, to the extent now that data is playing an uh, important role in these kind of consequential decisions across various domains of life, um, the relevant regulators definitely seem a concern. So, for instance, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, the employment regulator, is definitely thinking about this um, with respect to hiring and employment decisions. Uh, the Treasury um, is similarly interested, like CFPB, in some of these issues specifically related to banking and uh, consumer finance. Um, and so I think there's a, su a substantial amount of interest on the part of federal regulators. Um, I also think there is increasing interest on the level of state and some city regulators too, which is maybe less well known and less well explored. Um, so I think it's actually probably worth investigating whether your state or maybe your local municipality um, is also engaged in some of these conversations. And the very final thing I'll say is that the White House itself continues to kind of lead um, some of this discussion. It released a document, I guess two weeks ago now, that is this kind of summary statement of where the thinking and research is on the question of bias and data-driven decision-making, and I encourage people to look at that as well. So when Trump becomes president, then we can hope that this will continue, right? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a document that's designed to ensure that no matter who, who continues. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. So uh, two quick comments, first of which this is from one of the uh, people in the audience. Um, I, I think it's important to have a social science researcher on consult. Um, they're trained to think about these representations of data, omitted variables, bias, that type of stuff. Um, it, it is often possible to get someone like that through a local um, information school or um, some of the master's programs, that type of stuff. I, I strongly agree um, with that comment there. Um, I would also add that state legislatures are becoming more and more interested in this particular area. Um, and we're seeing some state-by-state -state, um, passage of laws giving individuals information about their data or re required reporting if there's data leaks or other things like that. So I would also try to stay up to date with what your state is doing. 